Okay, welcome everyone to tonight's program featuring Bud Mehoff and Hope Taft. I'm Chuck Peterson, uh, Vice President of the Granville Historical Society Board of Managers. Um, I should mention that tonight's program, as well as other programs we hold throughout the year, are supported by a grant named for former Denison University President Dale T. Noble and his wife Tina, who have always been supportive of the Granville Historical Society. So, speaking of Denison, Buck Niehoff is a 1969 Denison graduate who retired 10 years ago after practicing law for 40 years at a Cincinnati firm. Since then, he has written and published seven books, including one that came out last year on tonight's topic, Walking Ancient Ohio, and there will be copies available afterward. Buck is active in civic life, serving as the chair of the Board of Trustees of the University of Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Muse Museum Center, and the Mercantile Library. He also served on the Denison University Board of Trustees. Hope Taft was First Lady of Ohio from 1999 to 2007, when her husband, Bob Taft, was our governor. During that time, she developed a passion for native plants and the environment and created Ohio's Botanical Garden of Native Plants on the grounds of the governor's residence. She still volunteers to help maintain it. So she has since become involved in the conservation of the Little Miami River and the effort to elevate the Hopewell culture of Ohio to world heritage status. She is also the president of the Tandana Foundation, started by her daughter, Anna, to help communities in Ecuador and Mali reach their goals of water, food, environmental, and economic security. As you know, both Buck and Hope walked the entire ancient Hopewell Trail, so I turn it over to them to let us uh, let them tell us about it. Hope, Hope and I are very pleased uh, to be here tonight. You see, Granville was the final stopping point on our 160 mile walking journey that is the topic of tonight's presentation. So for us, Granville represents success. It represents reaching our goal, and it's a big achievement. In addition, of course, I have the personal connections with uh, Granville uh, going back to 1969. And because of the persuasiveness of my friends, Tom Martin and the late Tony Liska, I have periodically been a member of the Granville Historical Society. If you look on the back cover of the third volume of your wonderful bicentennial history of the village, you can see the blurb that I wrote about that remarkable trilogy that you published. One more thing about being here, and this is perhaps the most important. Granville is near the epicenter of the Hopewell culture that thrived in Ohio from 1 AD to 400 AD. These ancient people constructed incredibly complex earthworks for their spiritual celebrations. Two of the most beautiful of them are the octagon and the great circle in Newark. These two great structures along with five in Chillicothe and for an ancient near Cincinnati have been nominated for the UNESCO World Heritage List, which includes the most important cultural places in the world. Currently, only 1,157 sites worldwide are on this list. In the United States, there are only 24. To bring attention to these Hopewell earthworks was the goal of our 160 mile walking adventure. And we would like to begin the program by telling you a little bit about these stunning sites. So um, the Hopewell culture sites are very, very exciting and thrilling to me. And I first got a glimpse of them 
back in 2005 when the moon was at its northernmost point uh, in the horizon and um, Bob was governor and so we got invited over to see, see it at night. And I will be very happy if the, this is inscribed into the uh, list for energy sites around the country, uh, around the world uh, this year, this, uh, September when it's supposed to be, because it'll be about 18 years since I started falling in love with the Hope World culture. Wow. And that's about the length of the time it takes the moon to do its full circle. So uh, maybe when the moon is 18.6 years away from when I first saw it, at its northernmost point, we will be on the inscribed onto the list. Yeah. yeah. So I want to yeah, yeah. yeah. Get your fingers crossed. <laughs> we want to uh, show you a few slides of why uh, the Hopewell culture sites and ceremonial sites are up for uh, World Heritage nomination. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this clicker will work. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is World Heritage? Well, it is a listing of the most famous places in the world, and there are a lot of groupies, or in other words, tourists, who will try to go to all of them. So we think that when we are finally inscribed, many people will be coming to Ohio to see these wonderful events. And you can see some of them here, like the Great Pyramids and the Wall, uh, Great Wall of China. And it's um, exciting to know um, that these places are wonders of the world and that they are listed and protected uh, by 190 nations that are part of the um, UNESCO World Heritage System. And one of the main requirements of being on that list is that whatever you nominate has to be out, have outstanding universal value, which means culturally and or naturally, natural <coughs> significance uh, that is above and beyond most anything else. And uh, it should be preserved for the whole world. So it has more than just Ohio interest or United States interest, but people from all over the world would be interested in, in these um, sites. And so the World Heritage Site is really an American idea that was proposed by uh, President Nixon and based on the um, National Park Service that we have, I think that he was enthralled with, with uh, the Grand Canyon and, and some of the national parks that we have, and he got the idea that you know there are a lot of places around the world that should be <laughs> saved and preserved. And so he started uh, the uh, UNESCO uh, uh, cultural preservation of these sites. And why do we think that the Hopewell cultural uh, ceremonial sites in Ohio are important? Well, there are three sites, three main locations. There's uh, it's a serial nomination. It's uh, together these three sites tell a very compelling story, and they uh, meet two criteria of the ten that the uh, UNESCO people have, and of the selection criteria that we meet is to represent a masterpiece of human created genius. And after you had look at these things, you will believe that they are really a masterpiece of creative genius. There's no way that I could do that, even think about doing this, but they had done. And then unique and exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or a civilization which was li is living or which has disappeared. And of course, uh, 2,000 years ago is long past, so it has disappeared. And it is a uh, earthwork, is our testimony to cultural tradition and a civilization that has passed by. And so we think that we should be accepted in uh, September. So everyone keep your fingers crossed if you can keep them crossed that long. <laughs> um, and indeed, the Hopewell culture is um, incredible in the 400 years that it existed in Ohio. It made this part of Ohio the center of the uh, North American universe. It's what we would call it now. Back then, they didn't call it that. Uh, <laughs> um, no one did they call themselves Hopewell people. So, so um, 
but we know them as the Hope Road culture. And it's 400 years these people uh, built huge, beautiful, precise earthen enclosures. And they collected um, materials from all over uh, what is now North America. And this has helped you uh, see their influence um, and where their trade networks, um, um, how far along that they went and what all they collected. You can find great amounts of these materials within the mounds um, in, here in Central Ohio. And you can see where they're, the main ones are dotted around uh, Central Ohio, um, the uh, Scioto Valley, and then Newark is off there all by itself, and then around the uh, Miami Rivers and the Little Miami Rivers over where, um, close to where um, I now live. And these are known as the Hope Road Ceremonial Earthworks. And here is a picture of the Newark Earthworks. You're probably familiar with that. And uh, the um, Fort Ancient, which is very familiar to me because I live very close to it now in Greene County. Uh, it is the largest um, hilltop enclosure um, in the world. Its banks are, I mean, its uh, mounds are over two and a half miles long if you added them all up together. And it's a phenomenal place. And then there's the Mound City group in the uh, Chillicothe area. And uh, the uh, Hopewell Mound group and some other sites that we um, um, visited, yeah. such as this one. In fact, this one, you'll see the river along in the background. Remember that you saw it there because we saw it from the river, <laughs> just like the early uh, people did. Most likely did. And then um, there's the Hopeton Earthworks. And let's see, the High Bank Earthworks. And um, the Newark work Earthworks, as you all know, because it is so close, um, it was very important. It was these, probably the center of the culture of these people. Um, but Fort Ancient is also very important because both of them highlight the um, beliefs of the Hopewell people, culture uh, that the earth and the land and the underworld were all very, very important. You can see in this Fort Ancient uh, photograph the reflection of the water. And one of the reasons um, we know it was not a fort is because all those water dips are on the inside of the wall instead of the outside of the wall, as you might imagine if you were trying to really protect it as a fort. But these, they think that all these sites are really ceremonial sites and that they were used as large gathering places for um, people to come from all over North America. So the, the five earthwork sites in the whole world cultural national park are the ones listed here. And together with um, Fort Ancient and Newark and these Hopewell sites, uh, we have the um, foundation for our, our serial culture uh, nomination. And if you look at these, you will see that they knew a lot about uh, geometry and that they uh, re, no matter where their sites were, their dimensions were pretty much the same. In fact, uh, people have um, today gone and remeasured them, and they're within uh, two or three degrees of being exactly on the mark, which is almost uh, unheard of. And um, these two men uh, decided to look at this this site in uh, Newark to see if it had any relationship to the sun or the moon. They couldn't find any relationship to the sun but they found all of these points to the moon. And when you think that it takes 18.6 years for the moon to make its full cycle, uh, that's a long time if you only live about 35 years. So if you really, it really makes me um, in awe of their abilities to, uh, to uh, align things, to pass on information, and to be such wonderful builders. 
And here we are at the moon rising and the um, 2005. And here it is at the southernmost point in 2015. And 2024, it should get back to its northernmost point again. And we should be able to celebrate that. <laughs> and then now, now that you know why we wanted to walk this 106 miles, because all of these sites are very, very uh, different and uh, very exciting to see in, in person, uh, we will take you on our walk. Thank you. By the way, uh, put on your calendars October 21st, 2024, because that is when the celebration will be for the northernmost moonrise at the Octagon in Newark. And the, and the Ohio uh, Historical Society, sorry, the Ohio History Connection is already planning a big event uh, for that day. Uh, I'm a writer, so I have to read the script. I, I'm not uh, uh, as adept at public speaking as Hope. Before we show you the slides of our walk, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you how we did the walk. Our 160 mile journey started just north of Cincinnati at Fort Ancient, which is the southernmost Hopewell site, as Hope mentioned. From there, we went to Chillicothe and saw the five earthworks there. And we ended at the octagon and at the Great Circle. Because we were hiking along roads, a few feet from speeding cars, we had to do a lot of planning to find a route with the least amount of traffic. The normal uh, road distance between Granville and Cincinnati, and I've driven it 3,000 times, <laughs> is 144 miles. Because we were avoiding the main highways, we went 160 miles because we had to find kind of a twisty way uh, to get here. As a safety measure to help alert and slow down traffic, a friend, Gary Meiser, Gary, will you please stand up? Um, are you able to stand up? Not <laughs> able. He, he volunteered to accompany us in his car with flashing lights that he put on the top. He drove on the right side of the road, and we walked on the left side of the road facing the traffic. He couldn't go as slowly as we walked, so he would drive slightly ahead, park on the shoulder uh, like a safety beacon, and when we caught up to him, he would drive on to the next uh, waiting spot. To attract further attention, he placed five large American flags on the roof of his car. <laughs> his plan worked brilliantly. In most cases, drivers seeing his car with the flashing lights and the flags would slow down as they approached us. Another safety measure, we all wore these bright orange shirts, uh, which we had made for our uh, journey. Um, as you can see, they say Walking Ancient Ohio. And that was the name of our walk and also the name of the book, which is back there on the table. Uh, which I wrote about our adventure. Because an important uh, feature of the earthworks is their incredibly accurate alignments to the, move, to the movements of the sun and the moon, we included astronomy in our walking plan. We started on the spring, spring equinox, which was March 20, uh, 2021, at Fort Ancient, and we ended 90 days later on the summer solstice, which was June the 20th at the Great Circle. During our three month adventure, we walked on Saturday and Sunday every other weekend. Generally, each day we covered about 13 miles or about 26 miles each weekend. On our longest day, this was Hope's idea, uh, <laughs> we walked 19 miles and we paddled in a canoe 
five miles. That day we did 24 miles. It was worth it. <laughs> it was a great day. In the beginning portion of the trip, we would drive home at the end of every day and we return to our uh, ending spot the next morning. When we reached Chillicothe, we began staying overnight in bed and breakfast places and in small historic inns. Hopewell scholars told us that the ancient people traveled between the sites on rivers, as well as hiking through the woods. So to experience a water pilgrimage for part of the trip, we paddled about 25 miles on the Paint Creek near Chillicothe. As I mentioned, that's Hope's idea. <laughs> and after she convinced us to do the, can the canoe part of the journey, she said, you know, I really don't know how to canoe. I'm never done it like that. <laughs> so we found a group of uh, naturalists called Rivers Unlimited, and they provided us with uh, paddlers uh, who helped us with the canoe trip. Actually, two of the paddlers uh, turned out to be national champions. We were in really good company. <laughs> Hope and I were the principal organizers. We thought that other people might be interested in being part of our adventure. So we invited anyone who wanted to join us to come along. One person who walked with us for most of the distance is also here tonight, Christina Rasturnia. Christina, can you stand up? <laughs> Other hikers joined us for a day or two. When we visited the Octagon and the Great Circle, our group swelled to more than 30 people. Some of you I know uh, may have walked with us that day, and maybe if you could stand up. I know there were a couple of people I saw uh, uh, Dr. Shields, uh, Bill Weaver were with us that day. Maybe there were others. And uh, we appreciated you be being with us that day. When our final celebratory hike around Fort Ancient, which was only a little more than a mile, uh, at least 62 people showed up that day. Free food. And it was free food. <laughs> now Hope and I would like to show you a series of pictures about our walk. And uh, if you have any uh, questions or thoughts as we go along. <laughs> Ask him. Ask him. <laughs> so when Buck and I decided to do this 160 mile walk, I'm thinking, I'm not a walker. I better get in shape. So I did a lot of walking beforehand, and I have not done nearly as much walking <laughs> since. <laughs> but uh, here I am practicing. Uh, we got a friend to do a little research on uh, the places that we would uh, go through, and one of the places was Cuba, Ohio. But you didn't know there was a Cuba, Ohio. Well, <laughs> there is. <laughs> and we had uh, other friends, uh, such as Gary Meisner, draw us maps and make sure that we knew where we were going each day so we didn't get lost. And uh, Gary not only drove the 160 miles with us when we did it, he cased out all the route three or four times um, before we even got there to make sure that we were going to be on uh, byways that were pretty safe to walk on. And we wanted, one of the reasons we did this was to make sure you could get to all the sites without going on 70 or 71 so that visitors could really see and get a feel for what Ohio is like and the beauty of its um, um, uh, natural areas. And uh, here's kind of a couple of groups of uh, pictures of us. We saw lots of uh, signs and we ate well and we had some uh, people that um, walked with us almost all the time uh, from Cincinnati. And here is Gary's truck. <laughs> okay. And how many miles did you go? About a 12,000 or something like that? 1,200. 1,200. Okay. <laughs> but it was very important to have this van 
and had this flags up so that people would slow down. And we used it to carry everything we didn't want to carry in our arms. <laughs> Um, and used it all sorts of ways uh, as a uh, sad car. And I don't want you to think that we starved to death. We had um, very good eating. Uh, you will recognize the Bucks Inn uh, when it still could serve food. And um, the Inn of Cedar Falls. Uh, and um, we had a, um, we ate well. And we uh, slept well when we got to Chillicothe. Here we are at the Atwood House in Chillicothe. If you ever need a place to stay there, uh, we would recommend it. It, it turns out that the owner uh, was in the military and was assigned to um, Camp David. And so he gave, filled us with stories of, of various uh, people that he had served. Uh, this is the owner of the Atwood and Governor Taft. And then in the other picture is Melody Sawyer Richardson. She's the only person other than Hope and I who did all 160 miles. And that's the mayor of Chillicothe. In most of the villages and cities that we went to, uh, the mayor uh, of the community would come and meet with us and talk about the importance of the World Heritage uh, designation to the tourist economy of their local area. So we met with the uh, with the mayor, uh, uh, Margaret Farmer, and then that's my wife, Patty. And and Bob and the owner are in what he calls the governor's bedroom, Very and and on the mantle was a picture of Governor Strickland who had stayed there. So he really wanted a picture of Governor Taft. <laughs> So here we are and what the sun looks like at Fort Ancient. You can see we headed off on 350 going east. And uh, there is John Hancock who knows more about the Hopewell culture than anybody I know, uh, giving us a little lecture on the first day. Uh, Aaron Rourke is also there. He's part of the National of the Ohio uh, Department of Natural Resources and uh, also a very good paddler. So he helped us a lot. Uh, with our logistics. And uh, we started off on the road and we went through lots of counties um, and um, we walked down many, many roads. And uh, this is a good example of what Gary always tried to tell us is to stay in one group. Well, we have walkers of all different speeds, so it was very hard for us to stay in one group. Gary uh, kept telling us to cluster because we'd be safer if we were all together. And we always told him, oh, no problem, we'll cluster. And after about 100 yards, we would be all spread out <laughs> along the road. Uh, and you can see. Yeah. <laughs> and th this is Hope's jail. <laughs> One of the first places we went to was Clarksville, and if you've ever been to Clarksville, you know that it is a very small little town and uh, has a few old buildings. They say some of the houses were underground railroad uh, stops, um, but one of the first things we saw was this mayor's office that also served as the jail. And when we got to lunch, uh, we learned from some of the, the um, from a former mayor that the city council members wanted to tear it down because it was so old. And it just said, oh, just called out to my heart. And so when we got home that weekend, um, I wrote city council a letter and said, won't you please let a group of citizens try to uh, save this building because it's one of the things that you have and that people might like to see you if this World Heritage site really becomes an effort in out trying to say. Uh, and you can see Hope, uh, Hope's image appropriately in the building because she, she's the one that caused this building to be saved. And there's now a uh, group in Parksville, I forget the name of it, but it's dedicated. Do you remember the name? No. 
uh, it's dedicated to the preservation of this building. Uh, the nonprofit group has acquired it from the village. They put a new roof on it uh, to stabilize the building, and they're working to raise the money uh, to preserve it. One of the things we were told in many of the small communities that we went to uh, uh, by the mayor or other officials that we met with, they said that one key building in a community can save the whole town. Um, and I, uh, when we got here to uh, Granville, we met with, uh, with the president of the university and he told us exactly the same thing. He said that in Granville, it was important that the Granville Inn be saved. It's the biggest building in town and uh, it's a key building and its preservation was important for the future of Granville, which is why the university stepped up and, uh, and, and saved this structure. And we were very fortunate to have Buck walk with us because Buck knows a lot about architecture and he could tell us all about the different style, styles of uh, houses that we passed along the way. Um, I, I love this picture. There's a man standing on the porch. Um, he's eating uh, a bowl of what oatmeal. And um, <laughs> often when we would walk past a house, uh, the people uh, who were probably pretty surprised to see a bunch of older uh, citizens walking in wearing shirts uh, would come out to, to talk to us and see what we were up to. And that was very, very common. And, and often uh, people would offer us, like as this man did, he offered us to come in the house and have a bowl of oatmeal with him. Uh, other people offered us water. Another lady offered us uh, fresh eggs from her chickens that had just <laughs> laid them. And uh, uh, it, it was delightful to encounter all of these wonderful people along, along our route. And it was one of the pleasures of the hike. And we also saw many other uh, things uh, like a lot of farm equipment and a few cemeteries that are very old and some things that you might not expect to find on the trip. <laughs> but we had lots of interesting exhibits along the way. And um, all kinds of conveyances. And uh, we had uh, one notable voice with us? Um, I don't know if uh, uh, WLW radio projects all the way up here to, to Granville, but the man in the middle is, uh, a, a, he was a radio, uh, Jim Scott, a radio uh, uh, broadcaster for 47 years on WLW. Uh, he had the morning show from uh, 5 a.m. until 9 a.m. Uh, th this is the Batter Up Bakery uh, in Leesburg, Ohio. And Hope had scouted uh, the, the route that day, for that day, and she'd stopped at the Batter Up Bakery and told the bakers, who are these four ladies, that uh, we were gonna be coming and they had a big box of donuts for us to take along uh, on our hike, which they gave us for free. Uh, Jim Scott came in the bakery and, and he said in his very distinctive voice that people have been hearing on the radio for 47 years, he said, where is the men's room? Yeah. <laughs> this lady said, I know that voice, I woke up to him for the past 40 years. And uh, so Jim, Jim Scott uh, attracted a lot of attention uh, throughout the entire uh, hike and uh, uh, was with us most of the time, but not, not the entire 160 miles. 
And I found it very refreshing that I wasn't the star as a former first lady, that Jim Scott was the star of the trip. So it was great to have him along. Uh, we also connected with the um, state geologists so that we could learn about the terrain that we, excuse me, that we were walking over. And here um, we had a little lesson on um, what an esker is and what a cave is and what the glaciers had done to the land that we were walking over. And you know, you may be in a car and those little hills don't seem like much, try walking. <laughs> Ohio is beautiful. These are some of this, the farm scenes that we uh, passed. And here we are as a group getting ready to walk from uh, Greenville down to the to Paint Creek, and uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about it or not. Uh, I'll, I'll go through our cast of characters. Uh, this is Mary Mertz, who is the director of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Uh, she came with us. Jim Scott, his wife Donna, the, the great Gary Meisner, Christina, uh, Aaron Rourke, who organized our canoeing uh, that day, Hope, me, Melanie Sawyer Richardson, who went with us the whole way. And this is Senator Steve Wilson uh, and his wife, Jill Wilson. And Jill might be uh, uh, interesting to you all here in Granville because she's the president of Otterbein Homes. And here we are going across the bridge uh, in a nice little cluster. <laughs> and I have the Paint Creek uh, State Park uh, campgrounds and uh, one of the places that we stopped uh, briefly because we wanted to get on to Paint Creek. Would you believe Ohio has something that pretty in it? And then we did not canoe over this, but we did canoe in the flatter part of the creek. And here we are. Uh, getting started on our, our big water trip. We learned um, that uh, Ohio is a great place to walk if you're a, an American Indian or a Native American or ancestral or, uh, Indian because um, you can only have to go about 10 miles on land before you hit a river. So that the rivers and the creeks were very, very important, the transportation. Um, system in those days and you can see that Paint Creek has its eagles as well as its beautiful scenery along the way and those people in the back of the canoes are really good canoers. <laughs> Thank goodness. And here they are. This, these are the people that uh, ferried us up the river and got us out at uh, our first mound and up a very steep hill. You want to talk about that? <laughs> um. They, when they were planning the uh, uh, canoe trip, they said, we have a great spot where we can uh, uh, get you in the water. But uh, when we get to the point where you're going to get out of the water, it's a little little slippery. That was an understatement. <laughs> it was a straight cliff um, that we had to climb up. Actually, the, the paddlers had to pull us up with ropes um, oh because, because we couldn't make it up this uh, this cliff, and, uh, and it was also very muddy. But we were at the. Uh, this is what we saw at the top of the cliff. And you know, when we get enough visitors to come to see the sites, it would be a wonderful way to go see this sea mound. But they really need to work on the place to get out. <laughs> uh, but the uh, Paint Creek is a beautiful creek, and maybe someday it will become a uh, state scenic river. Um, but it is it, it is not in the right yet. But uh, it, this is our first introduction to a mound, and uh, then we went up to the Hopewell group site, and the signage there is very good. So if you don't have a tour guide, uh, like we did, you can still learn a great deal about all the different uh, mound groups and, and culture. 
but we were very fortunate uh, to have uh, people from the National Park Service help us decipher what we were seeing. Uh, the Hopewell Culture National Historic Park has a lot of different sites, and you can see that they're all right along uh, the riverbanks, and we did most of them um, walking between them. So it was uh, an adventure in itself, but it wasn't the road. Here we are again on the road, um, and you can see this was a, a day that we only had about three people walking that day, plus Gary, who was in the lead car there. But we did get to see a lot of beautiful sights. I must admit, though, I had a great urge to pull up uh, invasive plants, and Buck would not let me touch them. We would still be walking if we were. I <laughs> um, hope, hope, as you know, is a, a great naturalist. And uh, we had a practice uh, walk uh, before we did the, the great adventure. And she kept uh, pausing to pull, pull up invasive plants that she would see along the way. And the other thing she did, she'd pick up trash uh, and she had a trash bag. But we didn't make any progress because we were always <laughs> bending over to pick up something. So hope was forbidden to pick up trash or pull up an invasive plant for the entire walk. <laughs> Let's see, Th this is uh, 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 in, in a little village, uh, Tarleton, mm -hmm. the village of Tarleton, uh, which is on the same trace. Uh, if you know, uh, the same trace went from uh, southern, from the Ohio River uh, all, all the way to Washington, I believe. Um, and uh, we, we uh, stood in front of this uh, historic marker uh, in the little village of uh, Tarleton. Tarleton is famous for the mound that it has. Uh, it's in the shape of a cross. Uh, there it is. Uh, and uh, it's a somewhat unusual one uh, because of its shape. Most of them are sort of snake-like. But here we are, uh, after seeing the cross, we have to have a little lunch, so we just kind of stopped wherever we were and had our lunch and uh, kept going. And finally, we ended up at uh, uh, Buckeye Lake, um, and um, we were decided to take a, a trip across the lake instead of walking around the lake because it was shorter. And uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, Captain Buck lead us. And so Captain Buck led us on the boat, but he also led us on the land. So there's our two Captain Bucks. And here we are on the bike path headed towards uh, Newark. And uh, there is um, us getting on the bus uh, to leave Granville where we were spending the night to go back to Newark to uh, see the octagon in the uh, Great Circle. And Bill was uh, telling us all about it. So thankfully he was there. And uh, then um, John Hancock again and Gary had these great maps to tell us all about the Newark earthworks. Um, John Hancock, uh is a professor of areas at the University of Cincinnati. And he's the one who wrote the application for the World Heritage uh, uh, listing. The application was 800 pages long. Uh, and it was submitted uh, in January, January 27, 2022, and was accepted. Uh, and the international uh, Council on Monuments and Sites came and looked at all of the locations, including uh, uh, Newark. Uh, did they stay here uh, when they were here? They might have. Yeah, I'm not sure if they stayed here. Um, and they, uh, after the site visit, they also uh, approved uh, everything that they saw. 
So now the nomination is in the hands of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee, which meets once a year uh, to uh, decide on the uh, recommendations uh, that they've received. And they will be meeting on, uh, starting on September 10th in Saudi Arabia. In 2022, they did not meet because the chairman of the committee uh, was a Russian and the other countries that had representatives on the committee boycotted the, the meeting and uh, refused to attend. So in 2022, the World Heritage Committee did not meet. But, but we were meeting and learning all about the Great Circle and the Octagon, and here you can see us uh, right in your backyard in Newark. And uh, when Bob was governor in 2006, the fourth grade class over at Newark decided that the state needed an official uh, prehistoric site and nominated the Newark Earthworks. And um, because one of the, the girls in that class, his father happened to be Jay Hottinger, uh, <laughs> it passed. <laughs> So now in the governor's residence, there is this picture that was given to the governor Taft to celebrate that day. Um, we had this wonderful uh, trip and uh, big celebration. And then we went back to um, Fort Agent where we started because it was so cold when we, got, when we started, we couldn't really see anything. And we got Jan, John to give us a tour of the earthwork up there, and he's now standing by the gate uh, in the wall where the uh, people would have come up from the Little Miami River to get into um, this big ceremonial site. And then we decided we hadn't walked enough still. <laughs> and so we went over to uh, Dolls Arboretum, which is very close, and they have a mound over there, uh, which we saw. Uh, and you can see how a mound now looks uh, with all the trees growing on it. And we did some more walking. Um, th this is uh, Hope and I uh, at the Taft Preserve, which is also over east of uh, Newark. Um, and this is probably the only time we got lost. And you can see we are puzzling over our maps. Because <laughs> but, I wasn't there. Uh, That's right. <laughs> yeah, Gary wasn't there. Uh, but Gary's the one that gave us these maps that didn't make sense. <laughs> but we were supposed to find and look at this unique mound in the Taft Preserve, which, of course, we couldn't find. Uh, but we weren't going to admit that to Gary. So we, when we went back to the parking lot, uh, Gary said, uh, how, how was the, the mound? And I, I didn't want to lie. So I said, it was, the, I, I've never seen a mound like that before. <laughs> So then we ended up at um, uh, Flint Ridge. And if you've never been to Flint Ridge, I highly recommend that you go. It's a wonderful spot. Uh, there we have Brad Letford from the um, uh, Ohio History Connection giving us a little talk on uh, Flint and, and how you can find Ohio Flint in all those places where they brought famous um, beads and shells and, and mica to the central area and then we uh, went to the, um, the the flint the ridge itself where you could see the um, uh, places where uh, people had dug out the flint and then we got a demonstration on how you nap um, a piece of flint into an arrowhead and they did that in about 20 minutes from a, uh, just a rock to what he's showing you in, your, in his hands there and then Buck's looking at. Incredibly amazed. And um, 
we learned uh, from Brad that um, historically, uh, Ohio Flint was not mined very much before the Hopewell culture. But during that culture, those 400 years, it was mined a great deal. And as you can find what they call blanks in a lot of different places, and you can find them in uh, places where someone probably sat and, and made, made them or made uh, uh, points. Uh, and then after the whole world culture disappeared, uh, the amount of flint that was uh, mined almost disappeared too. The, the, the industry, the first industry in Ohio went up and then it went down. But here you can see some of the big holes that were uh, uh, that the people got the mint, the flint out of. And then we had one final walk we had to do. Um, th this is the uh, Grandma Gatewood Trail at Hawking Hills. Uh, and I think we did it because we got we were in the habit of walking. We didn't know what else to do other than go for walks. Gr Grandma Gatewood is a very uh, interesting uh, Ohioan, a very, a really a heroic uh, lady. Uh, she was a Hawking County farm wife uh, and overweight, heavy, uh, and she had 11 children and an abusive husband. When she was 67 years old, she said, I've had enough of this. And she walked out the door. The only thing she had was a tarpaulin, uh, which she took with her. And she began walking. Uh, this overweight uh, uh, farm wife, 67 years old. And she walked the entire Appalachian Trail. She was the first woman uh, in, this was in the 1950s, the first woman to do a solo hike on the entire trail. But she got walking uh, into her blood as well, and she did the Appalachian Trail two more times. And became the first person, man or woman, to, to walk the trail solo three times. And uh, uh, her last, the last time she did it, uh, she was 79, 79 years old, if you can imagine that. So Grandma Gatewood is a great Ohioan, and we had to walk uh, the so-called Grandma Gatewood Trail in Hockey Hills. She was really inspiring to me, <laughs> kept me going. <laughs> And here is Buck taking notes for the book that he wrote. Uh, and every time we turned around, he was sitting down writing and taking his notes. And then one of the most um, moving places we went is probably one of these, uh, was this place, which you all have probably seen over in Licking County, where there's the old um, church and a mound and the um, cemetery in front of it the two cultures that have kind of come together uh, and hopefully uh, after the uh, inscription that there'll be more understanding of the wonderful legacy that the um, uh, early peoples, the ancient peoples have given us. And I, uh, that, that's the Fairmont Presbyterian Church. I think it, Just north of uh, John uh, North 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 North. North. Yeah, right. Uh, is it called Johnson Town or Jackson Town? No, Johnson. Johnson Town. Yeah. So it sits up way high up on the hill. Uh, Brownsville. Glad you know. <laughs> we just walked it. <laughs> but but it, I think it, it points out that in the European culture, um, stone was very important as a building material, but in the ancient people's culture, land was much more valuable. And that's why it's really nice to see both cultures here represented so well. And here's our walkers and our photo credits. And uh, we had a wonderful time.
Uh, and if you haven't been to the, the Ohio History Connection, they have a wonderful new exhibit on the uh, culture and uh, the indigenous wonders of the world. And you can go and get a feel for how big these uh, mound structures are. They have one where you can put the Colosseum in the Great Circle to scale. Wow. And you can see that it takes a lot of Colosseums to make one Great Circle. Um, you can see how high the, man, the mounds were because they have them painted on a wall. And they dwarf um, people uh, standing on the ground. So it's a wonderful exhibit, and I hope that you will go there. And um, that's it. Except we have um, this wonderful brochure that you all probably picked up that uh, Gary Meisner uh, is responsible for because he is president of Scenic Ohio, and, and it's a it's a wonderful view of our trip. Uh, the book Walking Ancient Ohio, which is Buck's book, uh, is back on the table for uh, fifteen dollars, and Buck is donating all of that money to the effort of getting the World Heritage Site inscription, and then. You all might have read all of the um, articles in here. Uh, this book has just come out, but it is a, uh, all the articles that were in the newer newspaper at one time or another over the last couple of years about um, yeah. the sites. And they've been put in this book, which is a really nice book. Yeah. But we don't have that, and we have to order that. Okay. <laughs> what year did you do this for? It, we did it in 2021. Okay. <laughs> I have to think. <laughs> it, it's what we did to occupy ourselves during the COVID pandemic. <laughs> we welcome questions. Yes. You mentioned the pandemic. Did it impact you in any way during your travels or training? Uh, well, a little bit. Uh, generally, we were outdoors, so we that that was uh, advantageous. And, uh, and we couldn't stay together, so that was advantageous. <laughs> and uh, you might have seen uh, we we uh, wore masks when we would go into a building, like for lunch or something like that. Um, but uh, by the spring of 2021 we were able to get uh, hotel rooms and so forth. It, it, things had opened up and up by that, by that point. Yes. Doctor, there, there are lots of examples of where these kinds of sites were destroyed by Europeans for a building like in a Grand Rapids, there were massive areas that were leveled. Are there any notable examples in Ohio where some of the early Europeans uh, kind of uh, recognized the value and, and did things to help preserve them? Uh, yes, uh, the best example, uh, actually, uh, it's an important national example, is the Great Circle in Newark, which is almost entirely preserved the way it was when it was built 2,000 years ago. And the history of that was that the uh, people of, of Licking County in 1890, give or take a year, uh, voted a bond issue uh, to buy that site and to preserve it, uh, which was a very early example of the people of one culture protecting the artifact or the uh, uh, sacred place of the people of another culture. I, I think the people of Licking County uh, really have a good story to tell about that. And you may not be aware of that story, uh, but uh, it's something that you all should be proud of. Is it known whether and how many of the sites that make up this collection have been excavated in a search for artifacts and that sort of thing, or as opposed to those left intact, so that they have a high level of integrity, as opposed to the European kind of We go to the Serpent Mound, for example, which is a different culture and is included here. My understanding is it was entirely excavated, and what you see there now is, is other dirt that was piled up afterwards. I may be wrong, 
But what about in Jeopardy? I suspect that the Ohio History Connection archaeologists could answer that question better than I. Uh, I do know that they have sliced through some of the mounds and they have found that um, the people were very particular on what color of earth they put where and that they built those mounds one basket at a time. And when you think of a 14, 15, 16 foot mound uh, built one basket at a time, you have to marvel at their stick to it. <laughs> um, but, and a lot of the um, mounds were leveled for farming and they're now rediscovering a lot of those through LIDAR and where they are. But um, I have no idea how many are still in good shape. Not very many, I know that. Do you know maybe you can share with us information? What about Carol Osterborn artwork after December? What is that? Uh, I didn't I didn't I'm sorry I didn't hear. What's an auction that's gonna happen Oh uh uh, the question was, uh, what's going to happen to the octagon, which is currently golf course? Uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, in November ruled that the Ohio History Connection can legally condemn that property and acquire it uh, if uh, the Ohio History Connection owns the property but had leased it to the golf course for a long period of time. Uh, so the, the uh, Ohio History Connection is in the process of negotiating with the golf course the price for the buyout of the lease. And uh, that is unresolved at this point. I think it has to go back to court, the lower court, which will meet in October, which will help them decide uh, what's a fair price. Yep. When the heritage site is listed with this as a part of it, what are the plans for the trail uh, following that? You, you mean our trail? The, the trail you follow or the trail that you want, would, would like to see venerate that, uh, that whole project? Uh, Gary, uh, Gary could probably tell us more about that than anyone else because he has been working with the, uh, several departments. So what we've been doing is, uh, I've got cracked ribs, so I can't stand easily. Anyway, so what we've been doing is working with Ohio Department of Transportation, Tourism Ohio, ODNR, to set a route, a driving route, so that we can come up with some unique signs that relate to it. And whether it's called the Ancient Ohio Trail or something else, it'll have a special need. And so that those signs probably would be installed uh, sometime late this year, early next year. It's kind of a floating thing. As far as the walking trail goes, uh, it's uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure I would encourage it. You know, we were we were lucky that we didn't have any casualties, you know, along the way because a lot of those two lane roadways are heavily traveled and. People don't necessarily respect the 50 mile an hour sign. But um, we have talked a little bit with ODNR about certain trails being established. And there are uh, some hiking and biking trails that were part of our walk, Chillicothe and up in Lincoln County, you know, that paralleled the walk and really made it a lot easier and safer. So maybe eventually. Uh, so there's a lot of evidence that. Uh, the ancient people made pilgrimages between the sites. Uh, John also said that uh, Hope and I in our, in our group were probably the first people in a thousand years that went the entire distance. Uh, we probably will be the last people. <laughs> Because it is, uh, you need a Gary if you were going to walk it. So um, we're hoping to make it a, a, a automobile trail. Um, 